Hello there. My name's Phil Williams and I would like to welcome you to Audio Angling, the podcast site of fishingfilmsandbikes.co.uk. In the first instalment of this interview with Brian Harris, we talked about your history, the history of Creel which merged into Angling Magazine, and some of the personalities you enlisted to contribute to it. We closed at the point where, with Angling Magazine gone, for reasons already explained, you decided that your angling future then lay away from the saltwater scene. It might help here to split up your favourite option, which was game fishing, under the heading of stock stillwaters, wild stillwaters and rivers, starting with the larger reservoirs. At what stage then was this branch of trout fishing at when the bug bit you? Well, it was the stage where everyone did what Tom Ivins had advised. Uh, that was a sort of a, a 10 foot or 9 foot 6 split cane rod, double taper lines and double hull casting. I remember that I built myself an Ivins original from split cane, 10 feet, as he advised. Used to get the blanks from a place called JB Walker of Hythe down in Kent, now long gone, I'm afraid like many of the shops that used to sell bits and pieces for do-it-yourself rod makers and other people who wanted to make their own gear. The point was that rod, it was a beautiful job I made of it, I must say, but it weighed about, I think, about seven or eight ounces, and after a day's fishing my wrist used to just collapse. So it was wonderful when hollow glass came out as fly rods, and uh, me and my friends very quickly switched to those which made life a lot easier and you could fish all day and then still be okay for the evening rise. To an extent I suppose it would be much more of a voyage of discovery back then as still water trout fishing of the type we're talking about here was a fairly recent phenomenon predating the subsequent explosion in farm pond excavations filled with stock rainbow trout. Yeah well in those days fishing places like Weirwood and Darwell and one or two other places too The fish weren't big. These days no one is satisfied with fish less than two pounds. I remember at Weirwood and Darwell um, we used to catch fish averaging about 14 ounces and one year the the heaviest fish of the year at Darwell was a one and a half pounder. (laughs) You know we used to have fun with them and uh, we were quite happy. We didn't know it much better. The, The occasional big fish came out of course. But today I think Fly fishing, particularly on still waters, has got very expensive because of the the wish by anglers for bigger fish. You know, the bigger the fish, the more expensive they are to feed and rear to a decent size. And therefore that reflects the cost of fishing permits. Um, It's a bit of an unfortunate one. I think some of the fisheries that rely on these huge fish, like Letchlade and Abington, do very well and that they feel a need and I once or twice a year go and fish at Letchlade and thoroughly enjoy catching double figure rainbows just as a a sort of a novelty really and uh, we still use our light gear we don't go for this uh, sort of heavy stuff but it has become very very expensive and it's um, I think it's put a lot of people off because fly fishing really although I love it is a dying art at the moment there are fewer and fewer of us the carp scene has taken over as the big plus and uh, that's the growing industry these days. And you would doubtless have known and fished with many of the big names who were pivotal in putting this increasingly popular branch of game fishing on the map. So where did you and they feature on this massive public awareness learning curve? Well, I, as I say, I did get Tom Ivins. Um, he'd never written an article, so far as I knew, after he'd written Still to Fly Fishing as a book. But I wrote to him and, uh, you see, the rods that he promoted, all his range of rods, were made by Davenport and Fordham. And Tony Fordham has been a long time friend of mine and still is. And through Tony, I got to know Tom and eventually managed to write to him and say, look, I think I rang him actually first and got him to write a column for us. And he thoroughly enjoyed doing it. But again, you know, you're talking about a man who was so competent that you couldn't really argue with what he said. You don't agree with everything, but he was so good at what he did that uh, he more or less started the still water fly fishing revolution. And of course that was taken on by such men as his contemporaries, um, Arthur Cove, whom I also got to write, first off by ghosting for him, and then later on Cyril Inwood, 
who'd never written a thing until I ghosted for him. And, you know, these were people who had so much to say, but they never said it until I got them to do so. So we did benefit from their knowledge eventually. Reg Regini was a superb master of the fly, and luckily I went up to fish the loo with him on several occasions, uh, sometimes for a week at a time. Often Mike Pritchard would come up with me and take the photographs and we'd do a little feature or something. But Reg was uh, a very stern master. He wanted everything done correctly. And uh, I remember one day I was fishing through his beat and uh, I got to a place called the New Pool, which was down the bottom end of the beat. Very fast, shallow water. And uh, in those days, Reg used to have a, a Bristol car. He always had Bristols, great big silver thing very powerful with an aircraft engine in it and he used to drive along the the bank from the fishing hut down the beat and sort of back again and that was the way he did it anyway um, I was fishing this pool and uh, I was wading fairly well out in the pool because as I say it was only up to my knees very fast rocky water and uh, eventually I, I turned around and I heard this voice and heard the car engine and it was Reg he'd driven down he was, he was on the bank and he said, uh, what are you doing? And I said, well, I'm, I'm fishing for grills. He says, you're standing on the bloody lies. Shouldn't wade out that far. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, I mean, Reg was a, a superb fly fisherman and uh, uh, very strict. You know, he, he wanted everything done properly. I, I remember I took him once down with Keith Linsell to fish on the Hampshire Raven. And uh, we were fishing... Tom Williams beat at uh, Longford Castle and it was a lovely piece of water and uh, there, were, there was some grayling there which Red wanted to go at and uh, we were fishing one day in the morning and the banks of the Avon are quite marshy in places and there's very little drop between the grassy meadow and the edge of the river and uh, quite often there's a, a sort of a thin layer of floating weed. Anyway this particular day Reg was quite concentrating on getting his fly to these particular rises and he stepped forward and disappeared into the river and uh, he came up spluttering and we had to drag him out. We were staying at the Bull Hotel at Downton at that time which was a very famous fishing inn and we took him back there. He had a couple of scotches, quick hot bath. Within an hour and a half I think it was he was back fishing again but uh, yeah he was a great fisherman, loved it. You mentioned earlier the legendary Arthur Cove. Arthur, I used to fish with Arthur, yep, and he taught me a great deal, as did Cyril Inwood. Arthur used to fish quite a lot at Packington, which was then run by a fellow called Tony Chatterway. And Packington is, is quite a large complex of lakes on a private estate and uh, still very, very successful fishery. But Arthur used to come there with me, I used to meet him there, and we used to fish together there quite a lot. I fished with him at Grafham and at, uh, I think it was at, um, uh, oh dear, what's the name of the place now? Up in Warwickshire. Draycott? Draycott, yeah. Now, Draycott is my favourite reservoir these days. I, I go there as often as I can, once or twice a month sometimes. The fish quality is excellent. It's full of insects, beautifully run, very helpful people arguably the best reservoir for stillwater trout fishing in the country I think and that includes Grafham and Rutland. Not fished as much of course but um, absolutely beautiful. I fish it myself occasionally for the fry feeders late season. Yeah what I like about it is that uh, there are so many buzzers that uh, y you can fish dry fly on most days and have wonderful sport but with light tackle. My friends and I we go up there quite regularly as I say and we fish four weight outfits and have some tremendous fish, um, quite a lot of fish in the four or five pound class. I lost one a couple of years ago that was probably to double figures, but uh, we won't talk about that one. <laughs> Can I throw a few more names into the mix? Yeah. People like Steve Parton and Bob Church. Fish with Bob quite a lot. Steve Parton, I never met Steve, um, I used to buy his stuff and uh, talk to him on the telephone but I never actually met him to fish with him. Bob Church I did quite a lot. He was a superb fisherman, very knowledgeable, a great fish catcher but I never agreed with the sort of gear he used. It was to me very heavy 
but he put forward arguments that the reason for it was that he wanted to fish his way in any conditions. My policy or my general outlook is that if it's too windy, don't go. <laughs> Alan Pearson is another name I recall from the past. I met Alan several times. He used to fish for these big trout in the smaller fisheries like Abington and Churchill Farm. I've read his book and uh, I, I spoke to him and fished with him, as I say. But I don't know him very well and uh, he's now moved to Ireland, I think. I think he's worked or has worked at um, Loch Corrib. Would I be right in thinking that he got himself into a bit of bother at one stage? Uh, what are you referring to? Something to do with a record fish claim, if my memory serves me well. I don't think it was a record fish, but one person I know alleged that Alan had uh, claimed to have caught a Thames trout, which was not a trout, which was a salmon that he painted red spots on. I don't know whether it was true or not, but that's what I was told. <laughs> Yeah, that sounds familiar, now you mention it. Yeah, I don't know whether it's true or not, but uh, I don't know what the outcome was. <laughs> Let's move on to the running water scene now and Hugh Falkus. Yeah, I, I managed to get Hugh Falkus to write a couple of pieces for me. Um, very nice man. He was a friend of Reg Regina's and Arthur Oglesby's, so I got to know him through them. And, uh, yeah, I managed to get him to write for me. He was a very friendly sort of person and, again, very, very passionate about his sea trout and salmon fishing. i still got his book. In fact, I was reading it only yesterday again. I've met him a couple of times myself, living up here as I do in the far north. Anyway, moving on, my particular favourite approach to fly fishing is either big lures for fry feeders or lock styling. What about yourself? I like luck styling when it's suitable and I prefer to fish floating line and either little nymphs, midges or um, dry flies. I think the visual thing is the thing that's so exciting about trout and salmon fishing and sea trout fishing, seeing the actual take, whether it's a salmon rolling over your small low water fly or a, a trout sucking down a little CDC midge or something, you know. Going back to the still waters for a moment, one question I meant to ask earlier was your thoughts on small excavated holes in the ground stocked in the past with record-breaking fish, which often would barely get to see out of the day. Well, I suppose it fills a need. There are a lot of people in this game of ours, this fishing game, that want instant success. They know almost nothing about the fishing, which is evidenced by some of the letters you see in well, magazines like Trout Fisherman, for example which is a very basic publication, you know. Um, <laughs> silly questions that get put to them, allegedly, and answered are quite stupid. These guys are the ones that fish these small fisheries because if they went to Grafham or Rutland or, or Drakeup, for example, they'd have very little success because they couldn't handle it. They don't have the knowledge or the competency. They want instant success, so they pay their money and they take their choice. They, they want to catch whatever their limit is in as little time as possible and go home again. There's nothing wrong with these small fisheries. I mean, some of the small fisheries are excellent. I still fish uh, at um, Lake Down and thoroughly enjoy it. And there are one or two other fisheries in this area that are also very good, like Tenterden Trout Lakes over at uh, a place called Tenterden. Excellent. I've, I used to fish Packington and that was beautifully run. And I fished Abington quite a lot in the old days uh, when it was first opened and the big trout syndrome started there. Well, I thoroughly enjoyed it and it's great to be able to look into a clear water and see the fish you're actually targeting. Another water I go to, not a lot, but uh, three or four times a year is Chalk Springs down at Arundel, which is very well run these days and quite an enjoyable experience. But I wouldn't want to do it all the time. I prefer to fish for we can't call them wild trout, but grown-on trout on the bigger waters, on reservoirs. But actually, there's nothing quite like fishing for wild fish. And uh, to that end, I mean, a, a friend of mine and I, ten years ago, started a small syndicate on a part of the Upper Medway, which is basically in its middle and, and lower reaches. You know, it, it runs into the Thames estuary, obviously, but it's a rather muddy course fishing river. But up in the headwaters, it's uh, a very clear, gravelly little stream and uh, we took over a two mile stretch on a farm at a place called Hartfield which is in East Sussex 
and it was just a ditch basically overgrown the only way you could fish it was to put a rod tip through the branches and drop a worm or a, a drop minnow in but we set to and there were initially about 10 of us so there are now 13 or 14 of us including two women and uh, we worked we bought chainsaws we bought all sorts of gear and uh, over the years we've cleared the banks not totally but you know carefully we've built croys and small weirs and obstacles we've transplanted ranunculus weed from several rivers including the test and uh, the kentish tower we've uh, the environment agency uh, and i don't have a great deal of time for them these days but initially they were of great help to us and because of their interest in wild trout and grayling which is what we've got on our stretch of the stream they put in 300 tons of gravel to help the fish spawn because the gravel had become impacted with silt but it's a lovely little stream the best fish we've had in the 10 years we've run it is only one pound 15 a wild brown trout but most of them are sort of 9 to 11 12 inches if you're lucky We've also got grayling, which is a very rare species to find down in this part of the world, which proves that the water is very, very clear. The river comes out of Weirwood Reservoir, of course, because that was built across its headwaters. So we get uh, compensation water in the summer and, and in the winter, of course. And it's pure, beautifully filtered, clean water. And uh, in addition to the wild trout and the grayling, we've got such species that... Uh, also demand very clear water and clean water such as minnows, stone loach, brook lampreys, bullheads, gudgeon, you name it. So that's another option that we've taken up and it's beautiful. We, we fish it in chest waders because it's the only way you can get at it. The banks are what they call incised. That means that the stream is down the bottom of a six foot drop. So the only way to fish it is to get in at the bottom end and, and just very gently wade upstream using a six foot six or seven foot rod and a, a four weight line and tiny flies. But we do have some great sport. And uh, just occasionally we get visited by sea trout which uh, come up through the whole of the Medway system and uh, probably spawn with us, I think. That leads us in very nicely to wild stillwater fish. In particular, the vast and, dare I say, at times dangerous Irish locks, which hold some very big specimens and across arguably a range of yet to be recognised species. Yeah, um, as I said before, I, I, I tend to fish, uh, if I go to Ireland, I, I'm never very interested in going there and fishing for wild brown trout. So, uh, although I fish Corrib once, um, it never interested me to fish the big locks on the Midland Plain like Mask and Corrib and Sheelin and all the rest. When I go, and when I have been, it's nearly always for salmon and sea trout. And over the years I've really come to like, and love in fact, two parts of Ireland's game fishing. That is the Munster or Cork Blackwater and the Loch Caran system down in Waterville in County Kerry. I've had some beautiful sea trout from Waterville, from the Koran, and from the three locks above it. And uh, thoroughly enjoy it, and hopefully, before I die, I'll go back again. I don't know whether I'll make it this year, but I hope to make it next year. I've had a couple of six-pound sea trout from there, and lots of others, and only one salmon, unfortunately, but I got that two years ago. Luckily, I've got a friend who's a member of our little syndicate on the stream, and he's got a house uh, in uh, in Kerry right near Koran, so I, I get to go over there with him sometimes, and he keeps us in touch with what's going on. So the mayfly hatches and big cannibalistic trout in these waters do nothing for you? No, certainly not trolling. I think it's the most boring way of fishing, and this fishing on the rudder at Rutland and Grafham just... I wouldn't want to do it. It's next to trolling, I think, as a boring occupation. I wouldn't want to do it. But, uh, yeah, the mayfly, I mean, I love mayfly fishing. We've got probably and arguably the best stillwater mayfly fishing in the UK down here within, what, 20 minutes of my house. That's a place called Powder Mill Reservoir, which is run by the Hastings Fly Fishers Club. It's only 55 acres, but one of the most beautiful waters ever. It's surrounded by deep woodland full of deer and wild boar, and it's got the best mayfly hatch that you'll ever see. I've already had two lovely trips this year 
and caught fish on the dry mayfly. Lovely fish, beautiful heart fighting fish. So why spend all that money going to Ireland when I've got it on the doorstep? <laughs> what about the running water side of things for salmon and sea trout? Well, as I say, I used to fish the Blackwater an awful lot. I used to uh, go to the Blackwater Lodge and fish from there and one or two other places. And I thoroughly enjoyed every trip, mostly in the summer. We used to go in June or July. I'm not very interested in early springers these days because it's all sunk line and big rods. I like to fish with a, either a long single-handed or a 14-foot light double-handed rod with a, a line no bigger than, a, a, say, an 8-weight. Chucking 10 and 11-weight lines doesn't do anything for me at all these days. So, uh, yeah, the black water suits me and, and has done very well. Small flies and uh, light tackle and really enjoyed it. Wonderful fishing. I once... Uh, fished a stream from uh, a place called uh, Scariff. Beautiful piece of water. It used to be owned by Mary Green and her husband who died a few years ago. One evening we came back to Scariff, two of us, and took over from two other friends who'd fished it and caught nothing all day. Between the two of us, in the next two hours, I think it was, or two and a half hours, we had 13 salmon between us. There were only small ones, grills, up to about five or six pounds, but great on the tackle we were using. When we got back to the, the pub where we were staying, the others couldn't believe it. <laughs> we were very unpopular. Over your time on the game fishing scene, you will have seen a lot of change and development, and possibly not always for the good. What then, in your opinion, have been the most fundamental? I think there are two things that have sort of stimulated me. One is the carbon fibre rod, which has made fishing with longer rods or shorter rods, whatever, so much easier because of their lightness and their, their ability to cast beautifully and, and play fish well. And the other thing was the, the high qualities of fluorocarbons for leaders. You can fish very, very slim stuff and still have plenty of strength in the leader. So I think those two things together have made the fishing wonderful. I've never been so keen on the competition scene on still water, the so-called lock star stuff. I think it's done a great deal of harm to fly fishing, although a lot of people would say that uh, it's helped develop the still water scene, but it, it's a very heavy-handed, sort of thick-eared way of fishing, I think. I mean, as I'm sitting here on the table, I've got a, a little metal. Well, it's not a little metal, it's quite a heavy metal, and it's made of solid silver, and it says, Benson and Hedges fly fishing, and on the back, Runners up, and that was when I was fishing with the Bureau Bridge Fly Fishers Club in 1987 on Loch Leven. That was the international final, and we came second as a team, six of us. And I'm afraid I lost the the winners' medal for us because I'd fouled up to fish, which would have given us the uh, the heaviest weight and the title over a Welsh club. Unfortunately, uh, when we came to the Wayne, I said uh, that fish was foul hooked. It didn't count, and we lost by that exact weight. So <laughs> I wasn't very popular with some of our team members. Maybe honesty isn't always the best policy then. Well, you know, I've met uh, one or two people who have said they would have claimed the fish and wouldn't have mentioned it, but that's not me, I'm afraid. Who over your time have made the biggest individual contributions to where we find ourselves today, and why? Gosh, a lot of people. Certainly uh, the Midland boys because of their innovative ideas. They changed things from an adaptation by a lot of people from river fishing using river gear, which was unsuitable for lots of uh, big still waters, and started to use sunk lines and heavier rods and, and that sort of thing, and different sorts of flies, you know, the big lures and things. So I think people like Bob Church, Cyril Inwood, um, Stanley Woodrow was another one. They all had played a part. Arthur Cove, there were lots of them. Uh, Brian Furzer was another one. And I think that they have helped to develop still water fly fishing a great deal, but only on one specific sphere, and that is the ability to catch fish in all conditions. I'm a little bit more sort of fussy in the way that I catch my trout these days. I want to fish as light as I can and have great fun with them. 
I'm not that interested in using heavy gear just to catch fish. I'd rather catch just a couple on the gear that I use than eight on a, a heavy rod that's going to break my wrist every time I use it. What then do you see as the future of game fishing? Well, if it goes the way it is, I think that it's going to be a steady downhill, a gentle decline. Basically because I think that the old traditions and the nuances of fly fishing in the, in the old way, the proper lock style fishing, has gone out. And uh, we've got these guys now who have to catch fish, lots of fish and big fish, as fast as they can at any price. They brought in things like blobs and boobies, which I, I just cannot tolerate. I never use such things. Unfortunately, rainbow trout can be very stupid creatures. And uh, that's why I think competition fishing has done a great deal of harm. It's taken a lot of the artistry out of uh, stillwater fly fishing in the way that Tom Ivins used to practice it and people like Arthur Cove. They were nymph fishermen, mostly using floating lines and uh, were self-limited in what they would do to catch fish. But they did catch fish because they knew exactly what they could do. They were very competent. Whereas a lot of people these days, they fish a, a heavy weight, sort of seven weight, eight weight rod, fast sinking lines, blobs, uh, all sorts of things, and rip them back. And rainbows are very susceptible at such times, you know, sometimes anyway. And it's all very easy, and you get these people claiming to be experts, and they've caught eight fish in one and a half hours or something, which to me is just nonsense, you know. You don't want to do that, you want a day's fishing. <laughs> Do you think then, to some extent, that it's mirroring the way the current coarse fishing scene is going, with its move away from silverfish to carp? Now that's the thing I hate, this description, silverfish. I don't know what it means, I don't care what it means either. I mean, to me, it means, I suppose, small bream, roach, rudd, that sort of stuff. But I, I just, why don't they call them that? Why call them silverfish? I suppose it's the carp fishermen who have coined the phrase, I don't know. That's probably where I picked it up from, because as a non-coast angler myself, I wouldn't know any different. So apologies for that. <laughs> well, as I say, getting back to the course fishing, I still do a fair amount of course fishing, and uh, I'm a member and committee member of a, of a local club who've got some excellent fishing, and I still enjoy my tench and my carp. Not so much uh, roach and things these days, and uh, I still enjoy a bit of pike fishing at times, but... Um, Roach, I've had my share, and I've done it all. I, I've spent years doing certain things, you know, like 15, 20 years of bass fishing and never did much else. And then there was periods when I went mad on big chub and then barbel and then salmon and all the rest of it. So I've done those things. I'm not that interested in huge fish anymore because most of these commercial fisheries, the, the huge fish are put in at huge and they're so easy to catch because there are so many of them, I suppose, that they almost pave the bottom. And these carp boys, they think they're doing great when they go there and catch these fish, but, I mean, anyone can catch them. Kids catch them. I'd rather go to a, a, a lake that contains the occasional double-figure carp or a big tench and fish quietly and, and comfortably and do what I want, not with a crowd and a sort of a fishing platform and a gravel bed or something provided for me. I, I'd rather fish natural waters like state lakes or wild lakes. What then are your thoughts on high-protein baits, self-hooking rigs and having that high tolerance to boredom required to sit for as long as it takes to hook that one big fish? Well, I fished alongside a lot of these guys and they are really strange. They're a race apart. I don't have the need to use boilies. I mean, most of my carp are caught on bread, floating bread particularly, luncheon meat, maize and corn. I very rarely use boilies. I've only used them a couple of times, I think, in pellets. And I fished alongside some of these guys who've been fishing for two days in their bivvies with boilies out, three rods sometimes. And I've caught like 15 carp. Well, they've caught nothing. And they come round and ask me what I'm doing. And I say, well, I'm just chucking out bits of bread and then floating bread amongst the fish, and there they are. I'm catching them. <laughs> and it really is strange. I think it's a cult thing these days with carp. Not like in the days of Walker and Rod Hutchinson. There were some good carp fishermen in those days, but they were a different breed, whereas now they don't even think of a carp unless it's 30 pounds. It's got to be 30 or over. And all these people rush off to France and fish for these 60, 70, 80 pounders, you know. 
And I really can't see the point, because when you've caught one of those and you come back here, what have you got to live for? Because you're never going to get one of those over here. Recently, the British Record Fish Committee suspended the Wells catfish from the list on the basis that it was subject to illegal smuggling activities from the continent, which not only make a mock of record keeping, but is also dangerous for disease control as well. That said, in terms of the artificial and mockery arguments, could the same not also be said of carp and even rainbow trout? Oh yes, it does. There's very little difference. They put in carp at uh, huge weights these days. I mean, I, I'm told that a 40 pound carp could be worth about two grand, which is quite incredible to me. My local club, which I belong to, we've had a few problems. We inherited one water where they did have a license to stop catfish. And our members have caught catfish up to over, I think it's 60 pounds now. And this is in a water about three acres across. So these huge things, they are a great danger because they're not indigenous. And the result has been that on one of our lakes, catfish have got into there or were put in there, and they've more or less annihilated the whole tench population by eating them. And we've had one or two members, I know them, but uh, can't prove anything, that have actually taken catfish from one water and put them in another water, which is absolutely stupid because they just don't belong here. I was told in a similar interview to this by Mike Healing, chairman of the Record Fish Committee, that they would like to see all non-indigenous species not only removed from the list, but also from the country. Well, I've not heard of that, but uh, if it was non-indigenous, uh, then that would include the rainbow trout, which I wouldn't like to see happen. <laughs> what about the carp? Well, carp are fairly indigenous. They've been here since the Middle Ages, because the monks used to eat them, but... Um, I wouldn't go that far, but I certainly would not want catfish, and I'm not very keen on uh, pipe perch either, or zander as they call them, because they are very destructive fish, you know, in competition with pike and perch uh, as air predators, uh, they're pretty nasty. Well, if nothing else, you've provided us with a range of views which will, to different people and in the different ways, be thought-provoking to say the least. Also, a lot of angling history and a resume of what fishing could and still should be like if people in a position to do something about it had the guts to tackle the various problems head on. But I'm not going to hold my breath on that one. And very soon, unfortunately, accounts like this and the previous instalment concentrating more on the saltwater scene will be like snapshots from a bygone golden age. Which is a pity when you look at how the Americans, and to a lesser extent, but much nearer home, the Irish, have managed to turn the similarly poor situation around. My thanks then to Brian Harris for being so frank and honest with us here.